so uh, I would like to welcome Matthew Geiger to our lectures on free market economics, the Austrian perspective. Uh, Matthew is an economist, he's a historian, he's a philosopher, he's a social scientist in the truest sense of praxeology. Uh, Matthew earned his bachelor's degree from Occidental College a few years ago. Two years ago. And uh, is also the author of one many uh, YouTube lectures, podcasts on Austrian uh, economics. Uh, Matthew successfully completed uh, the Mises University summer program in Auburn, Alabama. And he also earned his master's degree in Austrian economics from the Universidad de Rey Juan Carlos in June 2022 in Madrid. So please, uh, let's give Matthew a warm Austin welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as you know, I was a student here, and I got to take many courses with Professor Jurgen. I just want to say he's the best professor that Occidental has to offer. When I was here, I graduated in 2020. We got lunch nearly weekly, and sometimes multiple times a week. So I really got to pick his brain a lot. And I think as his students, um, take advantage of asking questions. And it's it's you know it's okay to disagree. That's the way to learn is by pursuing the inquiry of thought and uh, really discovering for yourself what makes something true and what makes something right. And um, you have to pursue that on your own, of course, but Professor Jurgen is a needle in a haystack compared to all the other colleges. Um, there's not many Austrian economists, so you're, you're definitely in the best class that I could recommend you being at Kiradoxy. But today I want to talk to you about um, the Austrian business cycle theory. So it's definitely a more macro-based type of lecture and what it can be referred to is capital-based macroeconomics. And we'll begin with uh, Hayek's maxim, which is, I'll write it up here. So Hayek says, before we can even ask how things may go wrong, we have to first explain how things can go right. And in this lecture, I'm going to present to you first the explanation, technically how things go right, and then we'll compare it to how things go wrong. And that is the basic, basis of uh, the Austrian business cycle theory. And it deals a lot with sustainable and unsustainable growth. So, if we're beginning with uh, how things go right, that is sustainable growth. And for sustainable growth, we begin with our production possibilities frontier. So it's your basic um, PDF, you have consumption and investment. And it's something that looks like this. And what this explains really is that there's a trade-off. If you want to invest more, you have to consume less. And if you want to consume more, you're going to invest less or save less. And then from our production possibilities frontier, we have something which is the structure of production. And we'll get into that. And then 
Also along the production possibilities frontier, we have the market for vulnerable funds, which are right down here. And the vulnerable funds market. So this, this is very technical. Um, some of my favorite stuff to go over because it's kind of dry. But I think it's important because we're going to draw the distinction compared to the unsustainable growth. And then I'll present you some analogies of what this looks like in implications to the real world. But uh, the unsustainable. We also have our PDF, but I'm gonna save some room for our other diagrams. Okay, we're a vulnerable funds market. And then our structure of production. So let's go back to here for a second. When we look at the production possibilities frontier, when we're looking at how growth occurs, like in the Austrian school, we look at it as savings, accumulated capital, investing this capital, and these investments kind of drive the complexity of the market. So uh, in our structure of production, we begin with um, uh, Menger's um, idea of, of, of capital goods and, and, and different orders of goods. And what Menger, the founder of the Austrian School said, is basically there's different levels of goods, right? Um, you have higher order and lower order goods. So an example of higher order goods would be the beginning stages of production, right? Rothbard uses the example of a ham sandwich. The ham sandwich is like, right before you eat it, that's the final stage of production. Okay, that would be a lower order, order good or a consumption good. But to get to the ham sandwich, you need the ham, you need the bread, you need the knife, you need the mayonnaise, and let's go with the knife. The knife is more of a mediary stage. To make the knife, you need the refining and the construction of the knife, and then you need the mining of the metal ore to first get to this knife. So these are all part of the stages of production. So if our consumption good, this is consumption, on the very last aspect, uh, I just, it's a triangle. And this is called the Hayekian triangle. And usually for simplification, we use uh, five stages. And so you have like your mining, refining, manufacturing, retailing, um, wholesaling, wholesaling, uh, refining, or re retailing, yeah. Okay, so this is the Hayekian triangle. And what we're looking at is basically on this graph, well, that's supposed to line up. But that's what we're looking at. And if we shift our consumption towards investments, then we're gonna look at something like this. And this alters our structure of production. So instead, we're here, but now we have a lengthening and widening in the structure of production. We actually add another stage to this uh, structure of production. And the significance of this is that this allows for more investment. It allows for more growth in the economy. And so this is how we get a growing economy. Now, what this looks like in the market for loanable funds is we have our interest rate here, and we have our uh, saving, which will be the S, and investments. <laughs> Which is the and it's a simple supply and demand graph. So let's see. There. Okay, this is our rate of interest, and we know that um, this is where we're going to be. When we shift this production towards more investments, this now uh, this shifts our demand. There, so this is our D prime. 
Okay. So with this, uh, wait, actually, that shifted it up. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is a shift in the in the supply. Yeah, yeah. S prime, great. So we're here, now we're below that. So what happens when people save more, it drives the interest rate down um, naturally. And what an interest rate is, is you can think of it as the price of money or even the price of time. And it's not some artificial number, as we'll come to see with the unsustainable growth, that we can just manipulate with a lever. Um, what the interest rate does is it sends a signal to the producers of how much available capital is actually in the world available for us to use. And when we get the signal that people are actually saving more and we drive the interest rate down, this, this signals to producers that, okay, this is a good time to take these resources and start developing our much more uh, early stages of production. So this is what Mises referred to as the intertemporal coordination. And um, this is very important because when we get to unsustainable growth, there's an uh, in, intertemporal discoordination. So the last graph here is going to be the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the labor market um, in the different stages of production. So for example, closer to the consumption goods, we have um, a shift in our, and actually there would be a graph for each one, but we're just gonna stick with two in the early stage and late stage for now. Um, we have a shift in the demand for the labor in these sectors, right? So if we have real savings, we're not gonna demand so much labor and consumption. We're actually gonna demand more labor in these uh, uh, earlier stages of production. So here in the, in the early stages, the supply stays the same, but the demand is going to decrease. So this will become a dash. And uh, here, as we demand more, this is going to be an increase. So this will be fine. Great, this is technical, but we have to cover it just to give you the comparison. So let's, let's begin looking at unsustainable growth. And unsustainable growth is, we're not gonna save more. We, we basically have the factors of monetary and fiscal policy. Fiscal policy being uh, banks buy bonds, they, they, they buy bridges, they buy roads. And the monetary policy is we're gonna have either credit expansion or we're gonna have fractional reserve banking. And I think if you guys have covered this credit expansion before, basically it's just what the Austrians consider to be inflation. It's an increase in the money supply. And what an increase in the money supply does is it doesn't actually provide any new resources to society, it's just pieces of paper. How does it, more pieces of paper add any wealth to society? Because real wealth is real goods trading for real goods, where money is the, the medium of exchange. But when you just increase the piece of paper, there's no new wealth being created. And actually, what you're doing is you're disrupting this rate of interest and um, you're sending mixed signals to both consumers and producers. So here we begin with our um, original uh, position of consumption. And um, basically the, uh, the key thing happening here is in the loanable funds market. So for this unsustainable growth, what we're doing is we're now saying, hey, there's an increase in the supply of available uh, money for this society. So we'll call this S plus delta M for an increase in the money supply. The issue with this though, is this is sending two signals. Okay. On one hand, it's uh, driving invest investors to uh, increase more. And then on the other hand, it's um, driving consumption up. So consumption not only goes up, investments go up too. So what happens here? We have a new point that's outside of production possibilities, but this is unsustainable. 
So this is our unsustainable growth. And what happens is it goes out there originally, and what it looks like on our structure of production is actually we're getting more consumers and we're also in lengthening these uh, production structures. Okay, so now we've added these two areas here, right? Let's go like that. That's like that. This one is driving up that way. Great. Great. Okay. So this is kind of what the technical technical world we're, we're operating under today, where we have this uh, increase in consumer demand and an increase in production. Um, but because this is unsustainable, we can initiate these projects. But what ultimately happens is a correction. And this correction method is considered to be the recession. And the recession, in the Austrian perspective, is actually not only inevitable, it's the healthy part, the cleansing part of this um, incorrect malinvestment of, of resources. And so, what we have here, this arrow, is overconsumption, and what Mises calls malinvestment. That's this part right here. And this is the correction. We need, a, we need to correct. Why do we need to correct? Because this mixed signals um, of altering the interest rate is not based on real savings. So there's no more real resources. And so you can begin these projects, but you can't finish these projects. It's, it's the example Mises used was a master builder. He thinks he has 20% more bricks than he actually does. So he begins this project, and he starts building this house, but he can't finish it. So he gets to the last brick, and what happens? Well, well, because he can't, he can't finish it, ideally the best solution would have been to know as soon as possible that he can't finish it. Because he began building a structure that uh, that, that is different, that is, it, it, it's not, um, it's not, well, he needed to build a different structure than the one he began building. And um, on the other hand, consumers spent more than, than they actually should have been. Um, they should have been perhaps saving some more money. But when we have unsustainable growth, and we have a central bank, and they their job is basically to put more money into the economy, how they look at it is when they see the master builder on the last break, Basically, they're looking at this guy and they're saying, okay, what should we do about this guy? Let's not have this recession because it's, it's gonna hurt. Instead, let's just get him drunk. Let's just give him a bunch of drugs. And then when he starts to sober up, he's gonna feel bad about it. Let's just give him more drugs. And that's kind of what, what we see is this pumping of money is the, the heroin into the economy. And um, of course, it's not only unsustainable, it's inevitable that we have a correction phase in the market, and that correction phase is, is the recession. It's the, the, the correction of the misallocated resources into an economy. But um, the diagram that I have, and, and this is my notebook, by the way, when, when I took Professor Jordan's course on Austrian economics. Um, when I took macroeconomics, when I took my senior seminar, the last day I had, I threw my notebooks in the garbage, because that's where they belong. But this one I have, of course. Um, so the analogy that, that Professor Jordan taught me was basically, you have a beach, and you have these nice waves rolling in, and you have uh, uh, surfers shredding these waves. And you see the entrepreneurs coming in, and they see the surfers, all these surfers on the beach surfing, and say, you know what, we're gonna build some businesses here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna build some hotels, we're gonna build some restaurants, and uh, everything else that comes with a beachside business. 
Now, little did these investors know that as they were undergoing these projects, these waves weren't natural. These were artificial waves. And the waves were coming from a machine in the ocean. And this machine is the government or the Federal Reserve. And what it does is it just goes back and forth, pumping waves and waves and waves. And so this is the analogy of the artificial credit expansion. Basically, this new injection of money has an effect. And uh, I think this is called the, the Cantillon effect. And it's the idea that um, money doesn't spread out naturally or evenly across the economy. There's first receivers, or the early receivers of the money. And who are the early receivers of newly created money? Well, it's the banks. And it's the friends of the banks. Okay, they get the money and they get to spend it first. And what do they spend it on? You know, defense contracts. Anything that's basically unprofitable is what they spend it on. But not only that, they spend it on goods that uh, you know everyone needs, right? Housing, food, etc. And so this newly created money, Hayek used the analogy of, of honey, right? It pools up where you pour it, and then over time it spreads out. It's not just like water, and uh, immediately spreads out. So the honey gets stuck. And then when it naturally spreads out, this is where we have um, you know, the phenomenon that prices adjust. Prices adjust over time. You can't stop it. Um, and so this newly created money, this inflation, spreads out through the economy by being a signal to the producers that um, there's an increased demand. And this increased demand results in people charging higher prices. So the late receivers of the money are, of course, less fortunate people in a society. And now they have to contend with the rise in prices. And, um, well, you know, uh, Keynes thought that we can just, you know, increase the minimum wage. Why is there always a debate about we should increase the minimum wage? Why don't we just set it to, I don't know, you know, infinity or like a thousand dollars an hour and then we'll solve this issue of people struggling with, with the low wage. But the issue is, this is what, what Keynes called real wages versus nominal wages. Okay, the nominal wage is the number. Of course, if we want like $100 minimum wage, that would be great. But then, you know, of course, that's a, that's a price, price control on wage. You can't price anything under that. So you're gonna have these, uh, these uh, surpluses of uh, excess labor who can't get a job. But then you have the real wage. And the real wage is essentially what you can buy with the purchasing power of your money. So even though your, your nominal wage may increase, your real wage could get screwed. And you know, even if your, your nominal wage increases to $100 an hour, the real wage in terms of what you can buy with that money, adjusting for inflation could be less than that. So before you could buy 10 units of a good, maybe even with the prices adjusting, you can only buy eight or five. And now this affects people's habits and their actions. And um, so that's kind of the differentiation between uh, nominal and real wages. So what happens is when the government stops creating these waves, okay, all the surfers, they leave because there's no point of them being there. And these surfers were the consumers of these products. So when the surfers leave, there's no one there to, to, to consume these goods and services. So these all go bucks, and that that is the recessionary period. It's, hey, this was unsustainable and a misallocation of these resources. We need to correct for this by reallocating these used resources to real preferences, real demands that people actually wanted. That's why having an economy based on real savings is so important because it actually is a revealed preference of what people want in a market society. And um, it's, it's an actual intertemporal coordination between early stages and late stages of production. Whereas this unsustainable growth is uh, an inter intertemporal discoordination. It's the tug of war of, we're not only sending signals to producers to produce more in early stages, we're sending signals to consumers because of low interest rates that they can also consume more. And so this tug of war results in this unsustainable growth. And the correction method is the recessionary period. Now, um,
I think kind of kind of just uh, ran through that. Um, I think. Well, I do want to save some time yet yeah, for like questions about about anything, but um, this is this is this is more or less uh, the upstream business cycle theory. I'm definitely forgetting some stuff. Please correct me. Yeah. Okay. You but the questions you can just tell us about. You. I think maybe I'll just I'll just yeah I'll just uh, mention these books, um, and then if you want to ask me questions about the you know. Anything like anarchy, my time with Georgian, about Georgian, about Spain, Austrian economics, I'll, I'll answer any question. But basically, Mises began this, this capital based um, theory of macroeconomics, of economics, and this uh, theory of business cycles in his book from 1912, The Theory of Money and Credit. And um, then, uh, you know, Rothbard, one of his students, in his first chapter of his book, America's Great Depression, covers this. Um, this idea of the business cycle theory, and he talks about the recession of 1920. And the recession of 1920 is interesting because no one knows about it. And why is that? Because, well, the federal government didn't do anything to solve it, and it corrected itself. But the argument we hear is that um, we just need more money to, to pursue these things. And this is the story of the traveling horse doctor, right? So the story is that there's a horse doctor, he comes to town, and um, a man goes to him and he says, hey, my horse is really sick, uh, can you help? And the horse doctor goes, yes. Take this cup of turpentine, give it to your horse, and it'll be better. And the man takes the cup of turpentine, gives it to his horse, his horse was dead within minutes. And he goes back to the doctor and he goes, hey, I gave my horse a cup of turpentine and he died within minutes. What happened? And the doctor goes, man, I'm, I'm kicking myself over this. Clearly, your horse was sicker than I thought. Should have prescribed two cups of turpentine. And this is, you know, only common sense that 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 can save you from these logical fallacies. Um, Keynes had this concept of the paradox of thrift, which is if you save more, we're just going to bankrupt the economy. But it's it's just not true. It's not dependent on consumption. It's it's dependent on real savings. Um, this is what what Bastiat called the broken window fallacy, which is like. You know, a baker has this job and someone throws a brick through the window, okay? On the, the surface, it's like, well, the baker has to pay for a new window, he's providing business to the window blazer. But the unseen part of this is that that baker, instead of buying a new window, was gonna buy something better. He was gonna buy, I don't know, he was gonna invest in a new baking machine to make more bread. And uh, clearly, the society lost that because of, you know, this this investment that was not it wasn't the ideal investment. And uh, this is a very important stuff, I think, because it deals with with society. We're dealing with the diagnosis of why recessions occur. So this book was written by Professor Jesus Huerta de Soto. This was my professor in, in Madrid. And this is considered to be the best book on money and banking after Mises's um, The Theory of Money and Credit. And uh, if you want to know more about like this production structure stuff, this is Roger Garrison's book, Time and Money, which he covers all this. And um, when I was in Spain, this is a side note. I got my backpack stolen, and it was just some personal notebooks in that book. So the thieves, I think, hopefully read the book and got a good lesson on how to make money and the time in the society. But uh, that's all for the lecture. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, I would love to answer some questions if, if you have them. Yes. If it weren't for the uh, Cantillon effect and like the changes in money supply were like immediately known everywhere in society and felt, would there be <clears throat> any like real downside to inflation? Or would it just be that like, the dollar's worth less because there's What would be the upside to inflation if there were no Kantian effect? Well, wait, sorry, are you asking? Yeah, I mean, it's all yeah. rhetorical, but but like, you would just have an increase. You'd just yeah. be adding a zero to every... Yeah, it would just be no change at all. Or... Essentially, okay. but that's the, the thing is, because of the Kantian effect, there's the, the people who 
win, they get to spend the new money and create it first. And then there's the people who lose. And those are the people who receive the money once it's already circulated into an economy yeah. and the price is adjusted. Um, yeah, so, so inflation is really the enemy here, and that's kind of the, the underlying um, concept that probably I should have covered before jumping into this, but inflation just pauperizes a society, okay? It messes with people's, their earnings, their, their savings, their investments. It, it, it destroys societies. I mean, if you look at ancient Greece, and he says, writes about this in human action, um, or ancient, ancient Rome, he says that what really destroyed the, and created the, um, the fall of Rome was hyperinflation and price controls. And this compromised their society and allowed for the invading barbarian tribes to come in. So hyperinflation and price controls um, are the enemy to any thriving society. Um, and then you get this, you know, investments in things that people don't actually want. And it's kind of like the, the fiat uh, influences of money production. Uh, Professor Guido Holzman, he teaches, teaches in France, but he has a good book, great book, called The Ethics of Money Production. And um, yeah, I think I would recommend that book if you're, if you're interested on that. Thank you. Do you ever try to box security? I'm sorry. Do you ever try to box security? No, no. I'm going to do this with you, not a boxer. Well, tell us about your podcast, YouTube channels, etc. Uh, well, you know, I kind of. I'm taking a break from the podcast. Hopefully, I'll pick it up again uh, with, with a friend of mine. But right now, I'm teaching for a university in Peru. On, on economics, and um, it's just every Saturday, and that's great, I, I really like it. This is actually my first in-person lecture. I mean, I've done like presentations in front of classes, but like, to lecture, I, it's cool, it was good. And uh, yeah, I mean, and let me just say something about Oxy, oh my god. Um, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, there, there's been some, some good professors here, and Waldridge in here, I think he's the best because, you know, I had Dale Wright, he was great, taught a class on Buddhism, religious studies, but he's no longer here. You you won't find, like, when I went to Spain and I told Professor Puerto de Soto, who some people regard as the greatest living economist, um, that I got to study Austrian economics and uh, got to go to the Mises University, he said he regarded me as the luckiest student. Um, so it, to study this as an undergrad, you guys have a privilege more than you know, for real. Um, I don't even know any other undergraduate colleges that teach Austrian economics. Um, yeah, if you're interested in this stuff, like even if you're not that interested, you, it's a great mental exercise to think about this stuff, at the least. But if you are interested, just keep reading. That's all you can do. Just read as much as you can. Even stuff you disagree with, it's important to to expose yourself to those ideas. For sure. So what was the phone on like in Spain? Well, it was all in Spanish. I thought my Spanish was decent, but when I got there I understood maybe twenty percent. And it was sink or swim, so like I learned quickly. But um I got to do my readings and writings in, in English, which was good. But the program was great. I mean, it was great. The first day I was there, we had the introduction with the professors and the students. And then we got some beers, a couple students, me and, and some of the professors. And one of the professors is like, so Matthew, what is, what is your political leaning? And I was like, I'm an anarchist. And he's like, you passed the class. <laughs> I was like, awesome. But. Uh, that same professor also said on the last day that Austrian economics is kind of like being a Jedi, right? You need a Jedi to teach you the ways. It's very hard to come to these ideas on your own. And um, that's kind of the beautiful historical lineage of Austrian economics is like everyone has like their teachers and, and mentors and, and uh, they have their students. And, I guess you were like a rogue Jedi, I so really like you're not the formal teaching. 
program was great. Sure. Cover like each topic is a course. So public spending, macroeconomics on that book. Um, we worked up like as a seminar and intro to, to economics, economic principles where we read human action. Um, the history of economic thought with Rothbard's books on that, all the way back with the, the Chinese Taoism and uh, the scholastics, the physiocrats. In the modern day of school. Yep. Do you go back in time and talk to yourself while you're still at Oxy? Before you, or like while you're taking your class, what would you tell yourself? Well, I would say you're in this class. Regard. Yeah, like when you were already. Regarding like this or just general advice? Was that comments? Man, um, I don't know, like try to see them as much as you can because he'll, he'll, he'll point you in the right direction and the right way to think about things. And that's the most important thing because your ideas are the basis for all your actions, right? Misa says he judges people based off their intelligence. So, you know, your ideas will determine where you go. And if you have the right ideas, then you can trust that you'll be on the right path. And uh, I think just just keep your mind open, keep learning new ideas. Like you don't know it all. I don't know it all. Um, you know, humbly, he doesn't know it all. We don't know. No one knows it all. But we all we all contribute in our own way. And I think if you just keep that that mind. Uh, hungry to learn more, you'll be okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super, like, I'm like, I want to keep going um, with my studies, but um, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else than I am right now. Do you want to be a professor after? Yeah, you know what? Um, I just I just applied for my PhD, but I didn't get accepted. And it's okay, like, I, I'll probably get next year, but, uh, for sure, teaching is like, like people follow what they love in a way where, like, you don't make a lot of money teaching, right? But I, I love Virgin, and he teaches, so I want to teach, and uh, it, it's there's nothing like it. Okay, being an intellectual, you never prostitute yourself, you never prostitute your mind. Okay, your mind is open. People can, can sell themselves to make money, but they sell their life. And uh, if you have an opportunity to, to keep learning, like you develop your mind in ways that not many people get to. And that's, there's nothing really, that's, that's gold. That's real value. Yeah. My follow up on, you were in a class with me in 2020, I think, spring semester. And I still remember your project, your final project in Confucianism, uh, it was Confucius oh, yeah. philosophy, and it was about Austrian economics. And that was kind of like the first time I was hearing about it. I kind of like I actually looked into it after your project. I, thought that was, I was a freshman, so now I'm a senior. So that was many years ago. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to remember. Yeah. That's cool. How'd you like the poster? Ben Blackstone. Ben. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you. Again. Yeah. Nice to see you too. Yeah. 2020 was a weird time. <laughs> yeah. I kind of graduated. I didn't walk. Doesn't want to, but uh, I don't know, guys. Like you guys are like so so young. Okay, don't think you you're you're old yet. Like you, I still feel like like you know, kind of, um, I don't know, not an adult yet. Mm -hmm. So just be careful, dude. You guys, I know you guys have professors who are anti-capitalism and pro-socialism and pro this that but listen i don't work here so i don't i don't give a shit i'll say what i want um <laughs> socialism let me just talk about that the last five minutes that i have okay you have professors preaching socialism socialism is the most deadly disease to ever come on the face of humanity uh it's killed in the 20th century alone anywhere between like 60 to upwards of 120 million people um, and it's this idea that like we just need to plan more and we just need to take a little bit more control Lenin himself said the first thing a socialist dictator should do is take control of the banks 
and the money supply. And it's just fascinating how, even though this is the, the land of the free, it's still the state that runs the banks and the money supply. And um, you know, I think Marx was right insofar as the class war is not between people of producers and consumers because everyone's in a dynamic fluctuation of both producing and consuming. So you're both bourgeoisie and proletariat. But there's a class warfare between the political elite, the establishment, and the people. Okay, these people don't like you. They want you dead, but they'll settle for your submission. Um, they want you weak, and just ignore it. Just, just say okay, and you know, focus. Focus on what's, what's truth, because uh, beauty is the corollary of truth, and uh, trust me. These lectures you're getting, these ideas you're getting are stale, they're old, they're not beautiful. Um, these ideas are just, uh, but don't forget, okay, when you're in a program that's funded by the state, which all universities are at this moment, these are state programs, and they're pushing you to be apologists for the state. But, uh, you know, as an anarchist, freedom, that's not coming tomorrow, physically, but freedom comes from the human heart. You've got to be free first individually before you can be free externally and socially. Same thing with happiness. Why isn't happiness sold at grocery stores? Because you can't buy it. It's, 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 it's a personal um, phenomenon. It, it would be sold out in grocery stores if you could buy it, but it's not. It's, you have to cultivate it yourself. And that's what life is. It's human action. You, you live in this life, in this moment in time, and just do the best you can. Be excellent. That's all you can do. And uh, then you'll, you'll see like, the fruits of your labor start to, start to flourish. And that's your garden. I don't know what it's going to look like, but you know it starts with you. Two more obvious questions. The first one, tell us uh, about your research paper. Okay. And then I want you to tell us about what the Mises University is. Okay. My research, which was like my master's thesis, but um, it's called the Trabajo Fin de Master, so it's not quite a thesis, but it was still long, like 50 pages. But it was on the economics of suicide, and what I looked at was basically how the existence of the state uh, produces more suicides than what would otherwise occur in a free society. And so I began with, you know, human nature. And if you want, um, I can send it to you guys if you guys are interested in reading it. But um, basically, I began with looking at the monetary sector, how these economic cycles, you know, fuck up people's lives. And this causes people to be anxious, worried, depressed, and everything that follows with that. I look at uh, the military, how it's basically a hyper socially constructed organization that when people leave it, they feel lonely. And especially in our day and age, like people people can really feel lonely. And um, that was another aspect. I looked at uh, looked at the culture lockdowns because this was one of the stupidest things that I've ever seen in my life. But um, we locked people in you know in their homes essentially and this is imposed isolation. That you do that to prisoners. I don't think you do that to free people even in the name of health. Uh, and that definitely ramped up depression rates and, and suicide. Um, I looked at the education system and how it's the Prussian model. Okay? This public education system comes from the Prussian model, the Godfather of Horse Man. It was originally constructed to make people be good um, service members for the military. But we adopted this model and said that maybe we could just make them good citizens, which is a euphemism for submissive, obedient, and docile. And it kills creativity. Uh, you're on a bell schedule because it's similar to like a factory shift line. And um, I don't want you to, to think freely. Why does everyone have to be up at the same time, reading the same page? It doesn't make sense. But yeah, that's what we do. So. Um, there's also bowling that goes on in public school systems, which is really occurring no other place than these forced prisons for children, day prisons. Um, so yeah, this all was messed up, and uh, that's the correlation of the state's intervention in society and the distortions it produces, which is altered ideas about people's life and what they should do with it, which 
one resulting effect is more suicide rates. And uh, the Mises University, do it, do it. It's, it's, it. It will be one of the best weeks of your life. I mean, I, I think all students get on scholarship. So if you just buy the plane ticket, like they cover all the expenses, I'm pretty sure. But um, it's a week-long intensive uh, seminar on Austrian economics. You'll meet so many students who are just like, like me, like I was one of them. I mean, yeah, like you'll meet some nerds, but but it's okay. Like you'll meet cool people too, I promise. Um, and you get to meet all these professors. Like it gives you just such a better perspective on all this stuff because you need people who think like like we do uh, in your life if that's who you want to surround yourself with. And that's the best place to be is in Mises University. So apply, Professor Georgia will write any of you guys letters of write and. Um, do it if you can. I met, you know, lifelong friends from that program. Actually, the, the two dudes I met were like, dude, you should study in Spain with Puerta. And that's what I did. And I mean, I, I, I wouldn't even have done that without them. So, yeah. Uh, two things. <clears throat> One, do you need to speak Spanish to go to that? Yeah, you need it's all lectured in Spanish. Um, so you need to learn Spanish. But they let me do my writings, my readings, presentations in English, final exams in English. So you just need to like be able to comprehend. Not the Mises Institute. The Mises University is in English. Oh, okay. His master's is from University of Madrid. Okay. That's in Spanish. Oh. But Mises University is a summer is a summer program. Only uh, undergraduate students qualify. So summertime it's a one week program. If you want to apply, you can talk to me. I can write a recommendation letter, and then you get in. Actually, uh, they also cover transportation costs. Uh, student of mine last semester, Jujar, is still on campus. He attended the Mises University. It's a one week program. They need only to cover transportation costs. So, yeah. This is my email, and I have like, a, I have two Instagrams. One's personal, one's economics. I'll just put my economics. But it's, um, If you guys want any more information or anything like that, or want to check out my, my stuff, it's my Instagram, back to this location, and then my email is njgeiger10 at gmail.com. Um, yeah, and you know, I just, if you ever want to talk about economics, like, stuff like that, but yeah, I, you can talk to me for sure. I'd be more than happy to, to discuss some email chats and whatnot. Um, keep reading, it's the best thing you can do. Read, read, read. That's the best advice I have. Other than that, thank you very much, and wish you guys all the best.